So today I'm going to talk to you about a uh, topic that doesn't get too much love in our community, and that's the, uh, the low-level aspects of, of what we do. Um, the JVM is, is an amazing piece of engineering. It's got uh, man decades of, of thought and work and rework put into it. Uh, it's, it's just an incredible platform. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you where it's, uh, it potentially can go in the future and where it can relate to closure. So um, I think I have the honor of putting the first transducer on, uh, on the slides today. But uh, um, what, what we ask from the JVM is uh, mostly performance. We have a lot of interop. We have a lot of libraries that we can leverage. But uh, uh, today I'm going to focus on how we can uh, get the same high-level ab abstractions we have in Clojure, like functions, data, functions that assemble data, uh, remembering data and making new functions, uh, we, can, we can look for leverage downwards, too. We can look for leverage from the actual host platform and not just uh, the high-level uh, leverage. So today we're going to walk sort of 20 miles out into the field, and we're going to turn around and look around us and see what's available. I'm not going to prescribe a particular future. I can't do that, but I, I will... Um, I want to explore the, the many different avenues uh, that are available to us. So um, two of the uh, topics we'll cover are Invoke Dynamic. We'll do a deep dive into that. And a new framework from Oracle called Truffle. It's actually from Oracle Labs. So it's still research, but I think it's a fascinating, fascinating approach and um, something we should be aware of uh, in our periphery. So. Um, before we get going, I have, a, I have a little bit of my own legal slide to tell you that, that Clojure is already fast. It already gives us a lot of abstractions to do uh, what we need and get the performance that we require. We can use core async, we have reducers, we have folders, there's, there's so much. And, uh, um, but there could be so much more from the host platform. So. Uh, we hear about the, the premature optimization quote about uh, it's the root of all evil, but the rest of the quote says we shouldn't pass up any opportunities that are available to us. So um, to get started, we have to figure out how closure goes from the high-level constructs and how that actually maps down into something that's executable by the virtual machine. How do we fit this onto the JVM, all right? Uh, I know what you're thinking. Uh, kids these days are, are probably not thinking of transducers, but uh, they could. And it, it's still, we still have to figure out how to get the high-level concepts like transducers, folders, like just simple functions, how to translate that into executable code. And, and the way we do that is through bytecode. Bytecode is the way uh, the compiler talks to the virtual machine. It's, it's really the common language. Most uh, of the 200 bytecode instructions are grouped into about uh, a few categories. We have our control flow jumping from one set of instructions to another set of instructions, uh, comparisons, go to. We have our basic things that get things in and out of objects. We have a ton of value manipulations, math, casting, bit operations, shifting, your run-of-the-mill constants. There's a handful of ways to invoke things on the JVM. You can call static methods on classes. You can do virtual and interface calls on objects. Uh, you can call constructors, too. Those, those are um, sort of special cases. Uh, two of the, two of the uh, important categories of instructions are stack manipulation, since the JVM is a stack machine, and local variable manipulations. So when instructions run, they uh, operate on this logical stack. They can place elements on the stack. They can pop ob uh, elements off. They can duplicate them. They can do uh, various uh, twiddling of the, of the things on the stack. And things that need to transcend a few operations to, that need to live a little bit longer can be uh, stuffed into these local variables. And there's uh, things like arguments, there's a lot of intermediate values that are generated that you probably want to save on the stack between, um, 
bet between expressions and between function calls. All of these bytecodes, by the way, are typed, and that's one of the uh, features of JVM-specific bytecode that sort of distinguish it from other bytecodes, and uh, at least uh, maybe from machine code on x86 or, or ARM. So just to, just to summarize, byte, bytecode is executable data, but it's particularly awful data that deals with identities and locations and, and, and places. So more, um, more background. I don't expect people to know this, so I'm going to uh, sort of play human disassembler with a closure function. We have a simple function that takes two arguments, A and B, and it returns you a new map taking A and a socking B at the keyword K. All right, so how does this map? I've decompiled this function and uh, put the logical instructions here. So at the outset, you can see that what is generated is some class that implements closure lang ifun. It's a, uh, the name of the class is an auto-generated symbol. This one's particularly awful because I ran it in the REPL and that's, that's just what happens. Um, so all functions get uh, ifun as their supertype. Before a function can be invoked, we have to sort of assemble all the, the the information that's going to be used later. In this case, we have to get the var a sock, and we need to get the keyword k. Those are gonna be constants for, the, uh, for all invocations of this function. So we load them up in a static initializer. Uh, there's about 25 bytes of uh, bytecode here, and the high-level features is we have two static final fields on this. One of them's the var, one of them's the keyword. We have to find the var, stuff it in the final slot, and we have to find the keyword and stuff that in the, in the final slot. So basically to find the var, we call this LDC instruction, which is load constant. We put the namespace closure core and then the, uh, the name of the var, a sock. Those go on the stack, so the stack has two elements. Then we call the runtime's var to resolve that var and, and to grab a handle to the var. Um, we do a check cast and then we put, the, put that in the static uh, in the static field. Same thing happens for the keyword. We call the, the runtime's keyword command, and we, and we finish the static initializer. So this is logically like the static initializer in a, in a Java class. So this is just assembling what's going to be used for the invocations of the functions. To actually invoke the function, uh, we see that there's a method generated with two parameters, A and B. It will, the first thing it does is it grabs a handle to the var, puts that on the stack and it calls this get raw root uh, method call on it. And what that does is it basically dereferences the var. That gives you the actual implementation of a sock rather than the var a sock. We cast it to a function and then after we have this function on the stack, we're gonna load the arguments. We're gonna load A, we're gonna load the keyword K and then B. And then on, you see on, on line with the number 18, that uh, now that the stack is populated, we call invoke and we return, we return the results. So that, that's basically how um, just about every, every function works in Clojure. In the JVM, there are a handful of ways to invoke things, to call methods and to return from methods. We can call constructors through special, virtual and interface calls, we can call static calls, but um, the new instruction on the block, I say new, but it came out in, in JDK 7, and that's invoke dynamic. You can basically think of this as function pointers in the Java virtual machine. It was the first uh, instruction added to the virtual machine since 95. So that's, I mean, it was a big, big undertaking. Clojure does not currently use any invoke dynamic instructions uh, during compilation. But, so the point of having this function pointer is that the JVM used to mainly be about Java, right? And Java has a certain uh, set of calling conventions, a certain way of orchestrating the execution. And when new, new languages come around the block that involve a lot more dynamism, like Ruby or Clojure or, or things that just don't fit the mold, 
there needs to be a way to signal to the virtual machine that this is sort of an atomic operation, that this should be treated as if it was an instruction. So it's not only a function pointer per se, it's, it's, it's really a strong signal to the JVM. So it, it helps when the semantics of the language don't quite match the semantics of, uh, of the assembly code. So, all right. This is basically how uh, an invoke dynamic call works. You can imagine a stream of instructions that uh, as the virtual machine executes them in sequence, it, let's say it encounters this invoke dynamic call. The, that instruction encapsulates what's called a call site. This is an actual Java method, uh, Java class that uh, has a few different implementations, but it's, you can think of it just as a container for this method handle, and the method handle is the is what represents the function pointer itself. This is, the method handle represents the code, the call slide's more, more like a slot where, the, where that pointer's going to be, all right? So the, this, this allows you to change the target of the call to decide at a later date uh, what, what that instruction is going to do. It's the dynamic part of it. It allows you to not write a series of instructions that represent the same thing, but to, to write it in stone. So, um, the, the, and the other part is that it's, it's really about giving the, the, the virtual machine optimization opportunities, sending a very strong hint that this is an atomic thing. Um, please do what you do, but treat this as an atomic piece. So you can, you can think of the, in the decompiled example of the var and how you have to put the var on the stack, then call get raw root to dereference it. That can maybe obscure optimizations that the virtual machine can perform. It could, it, um, it's saying the how instead of just saying, saying uh, um, dereference the var, right? Uh, this also helps with the inlining budget in the JVM. There's certain heuristics about when a function is inlined into its caller, uh, Invoke Dynamic allows, um, allows a, a little bit better control over when things will be inlined. So the main object in Invoke Dynamic are, uh, is called method handles, and these are uh, low-level representations of function invocations. There's basically one thing you could do with them. When you have them in hand, you can invoke them. They're just a real, they're a real Java class. You can invoke them with arguments. There's two flavors of invoke. You can invoke it with um, sort of casting semantics and inexact invoke. Then there's the exact variety, which will, um, which will throw an exception if you give it, uh, give it non-castable things. There's a bunch of different types of method handles, uh, some to grab a handle onto, um, your run-of-the-mill virtual and static calls. There's some for uh, field manipulations. You can get, you can construct a method handle out of a constant. So these are not just constants that are in the class header on the, on the, on the class file, like strings and, and, uh, and numbers. You can get constants from a database and then make a method handle out of that. So you can, I mean, the database could be halfway across the planet, but you can get a method handle to it install that in a call site, and it's, uh, it's treated as a, you can get it treated as a final uh, variable by the, the JVM. And there, there are some other things that method handles can do that we'll talk about in a second, but um, the very first time you invoke the instruction, uh, the call site has nothing in it. It's just this empty, uh, empty instruction. So it has to be bootstrapped for the very first time. This happens only once on the first crossing of the instruction, and the Java, the VM will call you back. It'll call one of your bootstrap methods. And the signature of the bootstrap method just says you have to return a call site, okay? And you put a method handle in the call site. The call site's usually um, mutable. There's an immutable variant. But, um, but that's how it gets wired up initially. Other things that you need to do with method handles are derive them from each other. You can get a raw handle to an instance method but then you can transform it in certain ways, mostly with argument manipulation, and you can compose method handles together. So argument manipulation, you could uh, insert values into slots and then get a method handle representing the, the, the original method handle, but with slots already pre-populated like, uh, like currying. 
you have some, certain method handles will, um, will collect things into an array and spread them, kind of like apply. Uh, some of them will cast, and there's all kinds of arbitrary argument uh, manipulation you can do. The other side of uh, method handle transformations are, uh, are composing them together. You can chain two of them together. I actually tried chaining method handles to do, to do closures of function composition. Um, that's pretty interesting. There's, I think there's some, some headroom and, and performance there. You can also do exception catching. And uh, th there are a few more method handle transformations, but you might be asking, all right, why, why not just encode the same transformations but to encode them with the normal bytecodes. Like, why not just write out the manually sort of expanded um, execution semantic that, you, that you're trying to achieve? Well, it's, um, A, you don't wanna be rewriting class files willy-nilly. It's super hard, it's expensive. So you want to have a little bit of indirection. And, uh, and, and B, if you have a, a series of instructions, it makes the VMs work harder in determining what your actual intent was. So just, just treat it as a, a logical atomic um, handle. All right, um, so let's, let's zoom into guards, because guards are some of the, the, the most important types of method handles. There, there's two basic forms of guards. The first one's called guard with test, and you can think of this as a method handle that encapsulates an if conditional. So you give it three, you give it the test, you give it the target method handle if it's true, or the fallback method handle if it's false, and it gives you back a method handle that does all that. Then the other type of guard is a switch point. Uh, switch points are designed to be understood by the virtual machine. Uh, you think of them as a hot path and a cold path. It will always call the hot path until you invalidate the switch point, and then it'll shift over, and then it'll always call the fallback, the cold path. You can only do this switch over one time. Um, after that, you have, to re you have to recreate the switch point. So um, these two guards deserve special mention because you can do sophisticated things. They're, they're composite method handles, but really guards are primitives when you're doing language implementation. Guards are everywhere. So what can we use them for? We can take a look at the var. Um, back to our function that um, takes two arguments. Um, there's only one var in here, and that's the associ, right? Associ is almost never redefined. I hope you're not redefining associ because you'll have problems. But um, it's effectively final. So the only time you would really redefine a var is at, at the REPL time. We're, we're, we're going to talk just about static vars, not thread local dynamic vars. So, the, the basic operation, right, is to get the raw root, the, to dereference it. So, if we encode this in a switch point, what would that look like? Um, I, I, I have a branch of closure that does this for, for VARs, and it, the, the performance is, is pretty interesting. Um, the basic idea is your hot path is gonna be a method handle to the value inside the VAR. You're gonna make a constant. You'll dereference the VAR, grab the value and make a, a, a constant method handle. And you're gonna install that as the, the hot path in the switch point. And whenever that var gets redefined, we're gonna invalidate the switch point and we're gonna do some uh, fallback path. The fallback path, all it has to do is return the new value of the var and relink this entire call site into, with, with a new switch point. So you get a constant, you, you switch it over, and you have to sort of relink at the, at the end. Um, the performance that I've experienced on this was really, really promising, at least on micro benchmarks. It, it, allows, um, it allows as much performance as the, uh, there's, a, there's a branch on Clojure GitHub off of Master now uh, called Direct, and it's just about as, um, I mean, it's, it's the same performance as, uh, as that branch. So that, that's pretty interesting. So there's other possible applications. We talked about VARs, there's protocol invokes. Uh, you can maybe use uh, the, the spread and collect things to do apply and VAR args and closure. That's probably a more invasive change. I haven't had um, enough time to, to even begin messing with that. You can do it for multi-methods too, when your multi-methods, um, sometimes they're just simple switches between 
uh, dispatch statements. Sometimes you use the hierarchy features too, but it would be nice to have sort of some, some optimizations there. I did experiment last week with the reflection uh, to make a call site when you, when you don't type hint a function and you, you have to reflect and it warns. It would be nice if reflection only happened once. And I made a, one of those mutable call sites where it would reflect the first time, then when it resolved the method handle, it would just install that as the, as the, um, as the method handle for the future. So that works up pretty well. Uh, so next, let's, let's play human disassembler again, and we're gonna look at these keyword lookup sites. A lot of people uh, don't know about this optimization that's in the compiler right now, but basically when you have a function and it calls a keyword as the first parameter, there's an optimization that occurs. And normally you just want a map lookup, but sometimes that map, sometimes the something in this argument is a record. And if the record has a foo field, why do a map lookup, right? That doesn't make sense because, well, if it has the field, the Java already has bytecodes to uh, get that field by name directly. That's what, that's what the JVM does. So there's this optimization that's there for, for records. I uh, don't expect you to read this, but this is, this is from the wonderful tools emitter uh, JVM project. Um, this is a representation, a closure representation of the bytecode that is emitted every time you do one of these keyword lookup call sites, um, any time that there's a keyword at the very beginning of the form. So that's like 20 bytecodes there. It's, it's, it's a lot. It doesn't, it looks like a lot, but it doesn't really cost that much. It gets optimized very well. But if we were to think about doing this as call sites uh, with invoke dynamic, how would that work? Well, basically you have two cases. On the left-hand side, you have the, um, the map case where the argument is just a simple map. On the right-hand side, it's the record case. So when you, have, when you have the map case, you want to make your test uh, check, is this a record, okay? If it's a record, we're gonna switch over, we're gonna go to the, go to the right-hand side. But if it's not a record, we're just gonna call that middle handle, we're just gonna call the runtime's get. Uh, get function, and, and we can encode that in a method handle, and uh, we'll just return the value. But otherwise, if it's a record, you'll have to uh, call the records, uh, ask the record for its proper value and relink the call site to the right-hand side. Now, um, so when you relink the call site, you treat it as, you treat it as if the, um, the invocation is going to be a record in perpetuity, but not only any record, it has to be the same class of record because um, the foo class, the foo field on this class is gonna be a completely different field than the foo field on a different class. So the guard in this case is going to be, are you the same class as the previous thing that was seen here? But if you are, let's just grab your foo, uh, your foo field and return that. And if you're not, we're, we have to relink the, uh, the call site. We're gonna call this, um, we're gonna ask the call site to relink back to the left-hand side. So, um, it's not all wonderful for invoke dynamic. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of hype about it. It's a, it's a wonderful technology. I think, um, I think one of the, the V8 engineers was saying it should be a feature in all VMs. It's a really nice extension point. You can think of it as, as uh, like, kind of like tagged literals in, in Eden and, and trans in uh, it's, it's the same sort of concept. It's an extensibility point. Um, there are warm-up problems. Uh, initially, when you install a method handle, it's interpreted, but uh, it needs to get hot, and sometimes, sometimes it takes a long time for it to get hot and compiled. There's no story on Android, still doesn't support it, doesn't look like uh, Android will ever support invoke dynamic, and because it's interpreted, the stack traces are crazy. If you think stack traces are bad with invoke dynamic, it's, I mean, there's a lot. You barely see your code there. So, um, what else? Um, so, another couple things about invoke dynamic. It could be possibly used for lazy loading. Um, when you load closure core, there, there's been some talk about um, it takes a long time to load closure core but it's possible to defer that to essentially defer loading behind one of those bootstrap methods and just only when the, 
only when the var is dereferenced do you actually load the, load the class itself. And uh, apart from that, there's some interesting work by Zach Talman to unroll small collections. There's a, there's a patch that is being considered for the next version of Clojure that sort of fast paths, different collection sizes. And um, so it would be really interesting to use invoke dynamic to, to encode these uh, vector creation sites in, in the bytecode um, as invoke dynamic and to encode them symbolically. That way, that way future versions of Clojure could maybe iterate on iterate on the implementation, but the binary interface, the, the instruction could remain the same. That, that's interesting, that's, a, that's an approach that Java itself is using in Java 8, the lambdas, are, um, are actually invoke dynamic call sites, even though uh, Java is a static language, but it allows the, I mean, the abstraction allows you to iterate on, on either side of the instruction. So the biggest consumer of, the, actually the biggest producer of um, invoke dynamic instructions is the Nashorn project. This is a crazy project um, from Oracle. It's part of JDK 8. It's, um, it's a th rethinking of the Rhino engine. So it's really a way to make sure the invoke dynamic um, implementation is awesome. It does all kinds of compiler optimizations on JavaScript. It does uh, optimistic typing. It actually pretends everything's an integer instead of a uh, boxed object. It has all kinds of sophisticated um, things. And it's because JavaScript is really, really hard to optimize. So this function to double something, I wanna say it, it's a function to double an integer, but it, it could be anything. That, that argument could be an object. Um, it could be anything. So even though it looks definitely like an integer to, to somebody reading it, but um, JavaScript, if you want to make something from an object into an integer, you have to call this value of method. And you would think if you're gonna encode this in bytecode, let's just call the value of method and then save it since we're gonna double this integer. Like why, don't, why not just cache the value? Well, you could have monkey patched the prototype to value of and made it stateful. So you can't even, you, you have nothing. You have to, to account for the worst. So. Um, it's interesting how Nashorn approaches that. They use an internal representation, an IR, that's a, a sort of a, a graph of how the language works. The idea is you do the optimizations before you spit out bytecode. When they spit out the bytecode, this is, this is really just an amazing piece of engineering. What they do is they just pretend everything's a primitive. They're, they're like, all right, it's a primitive until it's, until it's proven false. And, um, they emit bytecode that just assumes primitives and will throw an exception when it's not a primitive. So what they do is they wrap it in this try-catch method handle, and when, when it's not a primitive, the try-catch handle will, will, will catch that exception, but the exception could have occurred anywhere in the middle of this function. So you might have work that you've already done and the exception's just in the middle, and you have to figure out uh, how much work has already been, been, uh, been accomplished, when you throw an exception, the entire stack is blown away and replaced with the actual exception. So they have to squirrel away all the intermediate values into local variables. And so they throw this exception. They have to figure out how to get from the middle of the function to the end. They do this with this rest of call. And then that, that rest of call is like a continuation. It only happens once. And the next time through the function, they rewrite the function with wider types, just less conservative. So this is nuts. Um, and it, it's, it works, though. It's achieved incredible performance, really competitive with V8, and it's implemented in, in um, the JVM. So that's just uh, amazing stuff. So it's amazing engineering, but why waste it all on JavaScript, right? So, like, why not make it reusable? And that, that's exactly what the Nashorn team is exploring right now. They want to maybe think of a, a dynamic bytecode and think of a way to use the Nashorn uh, infrastructure for all kinds of languages. So what, what can they extract for maybe like a, a dynamic language runtime? So um, we're gonna switch, we're switch gears a little bit and talk about a, a couple challenges. There's an interesting quote from Tiark Rumpf a few years ago about uh, higher level, higher, uh, higher level languages with, with functions and combinators, but call site based optimizations like we saw with 
the keyword lookup sites, um, could be fundamentally at odds with higher order functions. It's an, it's an interesting thought. This is sort of solved by tracing JITs where a tracing JIT can, um, can sort of optimize through method boundaries. That really helps, but we don't have a tracing JIT on the, on the JVM. Uh, there's some interesting there, uh, interesting research there. So the idea is for inlining, we would want to specialize uh, a caller of a function. Uh, sorry, we want to specialize a, a called function differently depending on who's calling it. So if, you're, if you think about reduce, we want to not only specialize the implementation of reduce, but we want to specialize the function that we're using, uh, re that we're reducing with. We want that all to be uh, inlined to the specific portion of the program. Two portions of the program might call reduce, and they might call it in different ways, but in consistent ways. This part might always call it with a vector, this part always with a map. But the actual implementation of reduce has to account for all those different implementations. So that's, that's the sort of the challenge with, with languages. So we'll shift gears a little bit to an interesting project from Oracle Labs in Europe called Graal and its sister project, Truffle. Graal is basically the hotspot infrastructure inverted and made useful in user space, moving a lot of the reusable bits out of C++ and into Java. They have assemblers for all kinds of backends, even GPUs. The actual compiler does crazy inlining. The compilation units are very large in it. It does sophisticated escape analysis, which is the act of um, realizing that an object doesn't, uh, doesn't escape the scope of the function, and when it doesn't, just tear the object apart, get rid of the headers, and just store the fields in registers. So that, it, it, it's really, uh, really good at escape analysis. So the Truffle is a, is a language framework that's implemented on top of Graal. It's a very simple model. So basically, you write, your, you write an AST interpreter in Java of your language. Think of the tree as a function. The root node is entering into the function. Each individual node in the tree is an atomic op operation in your language, all right? And you encode your language semantics directly in Java using the Truffle API, and it takes care of the rest. It's a, it's a really interesting design. So, so far, there have been a bunch of different languages that have been truffleized. Some of these have been written with uh, super small team, sometimes even one person starting. It's really amazing, and that's kind of a testament to the simplicity of the model. Let's zoom into a node, all right? We think of a node, uh, an addition node. The first time Truffle executes this addition node, it doesn't know what the types are, so it just punts, okay? It has two sub-nodes, which are the arguments from the function frame. And uh, the first time through, it, when it tries to invoke, it sees that the type is an integer, so the node rewrites itself into an integer node that just assumes it's going to be uh, an integer in the future. So this is optimistic. Um, this will specialize the node optimistically. And if that's ever disproven by the, uh, the types changing on one of the arguments, it'll rewrite the node into a generic addition node, which isn't um, as fast, okay? So the nodes evolve. Nodes can evolve not only by getting more type specialization, they can also ev evolve by inlining other portions of the tree. So think of the, the ASOC var that we're calling in that, in that sample function earlier. Why not just grab the entire tree of nodes for ASOC and just transplant it into the person, the, the, the stack frame that's actually calling ASOC? So you can do language level inlining, and Truffle even can do inlining for you. So it's all about moving these trees of nodes around. So what's the point? It's still an AST interpreter. Those are, are supposed to be slow, but what they do is they queue it for compilation. They queue, once the tree evolves and it gets stable enough, it, gets, um, it just gets fed into Graal, and Graal just meat grinds it and gives you back really, really nice assembly. It does all the, the compiler optimizations on it. And that's the basic model. It leverages Graal similar to the way ClojureScript leverages the Google Clojure compiler. I think I got that right. Um, so if, if something's been compiled and some of the assumptions about nodes get invalidated, it bounces back into the interpreter. The nodes will evolve. They'll get um, more appropriate, 
and they'll get queued for compilation again. So it's, it's sort of a cycle. JRuby is the most sophisticated implementation of Truffle, I think. Um, this is a representation of uh, a bunch of nodes in a, in a JRuby AST. You can see there's a check arity node in there. That's, that's when you enter the function. There's um, writing and reading from, from local variables. Uh, it's all direct. It's all really easy to implement. So uh, the, the, the point of this is the inlining operations. It's really, you can think of it as macro expansion for your code. You macro expand into more and more and more nodes. Ma uh, inlining is the granddaddy of all optimizations. It, it enables the rest of them to perform. You have to figure out when you want to inline. You have to figure out when to stop inlining, and those are, those are still sort of heuristic-based. But different languages can do different things. So if you take this to its logical conclusion, you have this project called Truffle C, which is an implementation of the C language in Truffle. I heard about this this summer, and I thought, why? Like, this doesn't make any sense. How are you going to interpret C and make it fast, right? So what they do is they just represent the entire AST of a C, let's say it's a, like a C extension in a, in a Ruby, uh, in a Ruby program. You, you implement the entire AST, and what you can do is allow Truffle to inline trees of C into trees of Ruby, and likewise trees of Ruby into trees of C. So you can have inlining across language boundaries, and that's super, uh, it's super amazing. They can even uh, inline function pointers, optimizations that GCC can't perform, because GCC has to, uh, is uh, ahead of time. You have to account for the, the most pessimistic case, but if the node just sees, hey, I'm always called with the same um, memory address, why not optimize that? So, Truffle is still research. Um, it's, it's still uh, ongoing. There's some, uh, it, it's already proven to be extremely performant. Uh, there's a couple downsides. You have to wait for your language to, to warm up, and you also have to wait for Graal. Since Graal is implemented in the JVM, you have to wait for that to warm up too. So you, you're kind of paying the warm up cost twice. It's still single threaded. They're fixing that uh, currently, but um, that's, just a, that's just a current limitation. But, um, it would be interesting to know what ideas can we leverage directly without even using Truffle or Graal. Are there, is there value in this model as an as a actual framework itself? Could we call Graal directly like somebody calls LLVM for their, for their language implementation? There's some, there's some value there. Uh, it's made a little bit more difficult that uh, Clojure is not a language that is trying to be the, the best Ruby or the best implementation of something else. It really tries to interop with the host. So this is, these are all the interfaces that are implemented by a vector. And there's a lot of them. So we, I haven't really dug into how you would model this with Truffle, but um, that, that's an additional challenge. But the value prop for, for Truffle is write the interpreter just directly model your language. Don't even worry about code generation. Let Graal do it, right? Just leverage it as the meat grinder. And it calls into question, you know, why even think about bytecode in general? It, it, seems, it, it seems like there, there could be a lot more power if we, if we think at, at a higher level. So um, before I finish up, I want to just inject a little bit of personal opinion. This is my... This is the personal opinion section of the talk. Um, where are we in the compiler? It is fast, it is simple, it's great. I've been experimenting a lot with Invoke Dynamic, and in certain respects, I found a lot of performance improvement, um, especially with VARs. I haven't found much uh, improvement with uh, changing the call sites of uh, protocol methods. So, I mean, it, it, you can win some, you can lose some. It's uh, in general, though, I, I don't recommend yak shaving on the call sites. I've been really, it, it's been interesting, it's been fruitful, but uh, it, it's not really what, what closure as a community, what we do best. We really want to leverage tools in a sophisticated fashion. So um, we do have challenges. We have challenges with inlining. We have challenges with making fewer boxes, more primitives. 
We also want any improvements to still be deterministic performance. We don't want to have some, some sort of performance cliff that you know, hits you when, you when you least expect it. And we, we obviously want any compiler in, in Clojure to remain simple, right? So um, these are challenges as, as uh, I mean, Java's beginning to move faster, and .NET was open source last week, so maybe Java will even move faster than, it, than it's already beginning to, to move. So also, these opportunities invoke dynamic, Graal, Truffle, the amazing tools analyzer uh, framework. There's so much value to be had, and I, I just want to encourage everybody who's interested in this low-level stuff, if, if you ever want to jump out of the, the high-level abstractions and, and deal with low-level stuff. It's fun. It's really, really um, interesting work. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>